Honorable Everly Paul Chet Green, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Immigration of Antigua and Barbuda. Excellency Ambassador Fatuma Nava Paolo Permanent Representative of Samoa to the United Nations. Distinguished representatives of governments and international organizations, dear panelists, you and colleagues, a warm welcome to our 2022 high level uh, political forum side event titled Financing for Sustainable Development in Vulnerable Countries. This is a topic of high interest as we collectively face major challenges brought about um, by the um, triple crisis of food, energy, and debt and the never ending pandemic. Uh, having listened to the high level political forum over the last few days, the financing, the development financing remains one of the major challenges that ca all countries uh, speak about in presenting their SDG progress or lack of progress. The event today is co-hosted by the government of Antigua and Barbuda, the government of Samoa and the SEEDS Resident Coordinators Network jointly with the Sustainable Development Solutions uh, Network. And um, maybe just as a way of introduction, over the last two years, the SEEDS Resident Coordinators Network, together with the Sustainable Development Network, have worked on the development of a universal multidimensional vulnerability index at the request of the small island developing states and also um, into a General Assembly resolution, Resolution 75215. Our index is today um, on one of the inputs to the high-level expert panel that was established by the President of the General Assembly. Antigua and Barbuda and uh, Norway are uh, co-chairing the panel, and I'm very pleased that the Ambassador uh, of Samoa, Permanent Representative to the United Nations, who is with us today, is also a member of the panel. As the index is about to be finalized with the report expected on 29th of um, August and um, deliberations to follow, we think that it is time to discuss the entire journey moving from the index to uh, the actual solutions that um, we need. And um, in that regard, uh, we would like to discuss today how from the development of the MVI, we are going to be able to measure the financing gap for the SDGs and then discuss solutions. So most of the presenters today are going to address those topics. It is with great honor that I give the floor for the opening of our meeting to Honorable Everly Paul Chad Green, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Immigration and a member of Parliament of Antigua and, and Barbuda. And let me once again mention that Antigua and Barbuda is uh, the chair of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States and a great partner into the development of the index and into the broader discussion of uh, development uh, finance, access to development financing for vulnerable countries and ultimately for all countries that struggle at, at this time to recover from the multiple crises. Honorable Minister, the floor is yours. Excellencies, partner co-hosts, ladies and gentlemen, climate change, incidents of pandemics, the socioeconomic crisis and the war in Ukraine are all direct threats to the most vulnerable countries achieving the sustainable development goals. The accepted wisdom that the development process is linear and that one size fits all as a response measure is certainly outdated. Developing countries remain most vulnerable to global shocks and SIDS are particularly more vulnerable as we tick every vulnerability box within the context of the SDGs. The impact of the pandemic on developing countries and our ability to achieve the SDGs in the remaining eight years should be a most worrisome matter of concern to us all. While SIDS are meant to be universal, the process of implementation is not. Richer and more advanced economies are equipped with the financial resources to fully implement the SDGs within the national context. On the other hand, the most vulnerable countries are left wanting. Developed countries and private sector must step up and provide the necessary resources needed so that all countries, and I repeat, all countries, big and small, 
can raise to the 2030, knowing that the finances are available to fully meet the demands of the SDGs. While financial support is required, capacity building, transfer of technology, physical infrastructure, and improvement of human capabilities are also necessary. The COVID-19 pandemic opened the eyes of the world as to just how vulnerable we all are. How easily our human, financial, and physical security can be wiped away at a moment's notice. The sense of hopelessness and of helplessness that engendered all countries during the global lockdown is not new to us in since. We experienced this during every hurricane and with every new devastation. The pandemic laid bare before and beyond the scale of SIDS and LDCs, just how interconnected we are as a global community. And at the same time, the inadequacy of the global response. A response that allowed the richer countries to pump trillions of dollars into the economies with a stroke of a pen and their reluctance to fully support the 2030 agenda with that same stroke of a pen. Striking the right balance, therefore, between national and global interests sometimes can be so difficult, painstakingly difficult. What, however, should not be difficult is providing means of implementation for the 2030 agenda, and in particular, the SDGs. My dear friends, in closing, I want to stress that the COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with the war in Ukraine, are time-bound events. The climate crisis is the true enemy and will continue to impact our achievement of the SDGs. We will need all the tools in our arsenal, including a recommitment to the 2030 agenda, because my country and others like it, who are barely hanging on to the goals as outlined in the 2030 agenda, demand and deserve this attention. We need the support of everyone, every country, the UN system, the private sector, and civil society as we race towards 2030 with a mere eight years remaining. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to address this very important meeting and wish you very successful deliberations as we continue to make interventions on this very important issue facing humanity. If it pleases you, have a great day. Honorable Minister Green, thank you so very much for all those reasons that you have mentioned, uh, SEEDS resident coordinators um, across the world, including my distinguished colleague, uh, Didier Trebuk, uh, resident coordinator in the Caribbean, have worked over the last two years to define the index. We do know we are fully aware of the challenges that SEEDS are facing, and we do know that there are prospects for uh, sustainable development are much more limited within the financing envelope that they have access to. I'm pleased that international financial uh, organizations are with us today. They will present their understanding of the uh, index and how the index will be used for access to development financing. And I wish to um, thank again the government of Antigua and Barbuda for the passion, the leadership, uh, that has been um, uh, given to, to us throughout the process of developing uh, the index. And we look forward to the upcoming discussion in which we will talk about the next 10 year seeds agenda, uh, possibly moving to the uh, Caribbean from Samoa. Thank you so much. And uh, for the panel discussions, I'm going to give the floor to the moderators. Our first moderator is Dr. Isabella Massa, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the team led by Professor Jeffrey Zachs, who is going to join us uh, through the meeting uh, at some point. Um, Isabella Massa has been uh, the technical lead of most of the work that we've produced uh, together. And uh, we look forward to the discussions, panel one on measuring vulnerability, panel two on uh, measuring the, the SDG financing, uh, panel two, on financing solutions. Dr. Massa, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Simona, for the introduction. Uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a senior economist uh, at uh, um, the Paris Office of a Sustainable Development Solution Network, uh, working together with Professor Sachs and our uh, vice president and the head of the Paris Office, Guillaume Lafortune, uh, on uh, um, small island uh, developing states uh, related issues, as well as on the issue of SDG financing. So, I'm very honored, and it's a great pleasure for me to be moderating for panel one today. Um, so uh, just uh, uh, to say uh, today we have unfortunately a tight uh, schedule, a quite packed uh, agenda. So I encourage the panelists to keep uh, uh, their interventions within uh, the five to seven minutes uh, allowed. And uh, I also invite uh, the participants uh, to ask uh, questions in the question and answer box uh, at the bottom of uh, the Zoom panel. And if the time permits, uh, we will have uh, a question and answer session following the two panel discussions. Otherwise, we will do our best uh, to respond to some of the questions after the event. And of course, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to us at uh, info at sdgindex.org. So now let's jump uh, into our first uh, panel conversation. Uh, so as it has already been mentioned, uh, um, there is a lot of discussion around the development of the multidimensional vulnerability index. A revision of uh, the criteria to access concessional finance is needed to take into account uh, countries' vulnerability. And that's why uh, the UN will soon finalize the multidimensional vulnerability index. Hello. But in addition to this, uh, it is also important for countries uh, uh, to quantify uh, the scale of uh, the additional financing that they need to build their resilience, uh, including to natural hazards, and also to advance on all the 17 uh, SDGs. Um, so uh, let me now uh, start by uh, introducing uh, uh, our first distinguished speakers. So all the speakers of this panel will provide their views and insights on how best the SDG uh, financing gap could be measured. So I'm a honor uh, to welcome uh, our first panelist, uh, Dr. Simona Marinescu, uh, who is uh, serving as a UN resident coordinator uh, in Samoa, uh, Cook Islands, Niue, and Tokelau. Uh, Simona is also a colleague of mine because, uh, as she mentioned, over the last two years we have been uh, collaborating uh, for uh, producing uh, what is uh, uh, today uh, the pilot uh, SDSN uh, Multidimensional Vulnerability Index, and we are also currently working uh, on uh, SDG uh, financing uh, gaps in, uh, in particular in small island developing states. So, uh, Simona, why is it important uh, to measure the SDG financing gap and uh, which is the methodology that uh, the UN resident coordinators uh, in a small island developing states uh, are uh, proposing? Over to you, Simona. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Massa. I'm just waiting for my uh, few slides on the screen, but let me just make a very brief introduction to mentioned that um, the MVI, the multidimensional vulnerability index that we've produced, is meant to be a metric complementing the GNI per capita. As the distinguished uh, Minister of um, Foreign Affairs, Trade and Immigration of Antigua and Barbuda mentioned, uh, development is not linear, it has never been. The progress in the GNI per capita is not necessarily an indication of the needs that countries continue to have. And as we could see in small island developing states, the uh, GNI per capita is a misleading indicator as countries continue to uh, face major vulnerabilities. I will go very quickly through a few slides and I'm kindly asking you to move to the next, please. As um, mentioned, uh, the uh, index that we've produced and I'm referring to the SEEDS resident coordinator offices SIDS, of course, stands for Small Island Developing States, uh, together with the, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and with the guidance of Professor Sachs. Um, the um, MVI, the index, um, has been constructed to draw on inherent vulnerabilities of SIDS and uh, primarily on exogenous factors affecting uh, economic um, and social uh, progress. And uh, as the General Assembly resolution um, issued um, recently, uh, Resolution 76-203, uh, 
request. The index itself must be exogenous. We need to look into uh, factors that affect development progress that are not solvable um, with the means that governments have with policies and laws and budgets. And uh, in that regard, we constructed the index on three pillars, economic vulnerabilities, environmental vulnerabilities, and structural development limitations. There have been questions as to why not social vulnerabilities. As mentioned, social vulnerabilities are primarily an output, a result of those inherent vulnerabilities. Seeds economies are very small. Opportunities for employment remain um, limited and again, um, uh, affect very, very volatile as um, uh, those are countries that have uh, export concentration on tourism uh, services that again are always affected by crisis. The pandemic though offered us an opportunity to identify additional vulnerabilities that seeds are facing. So this is a much more refined analysis than the initial uh, thinking. And with the, the index, uh, the construction um, of it, the selection of variables took into consideration the need for comparability as the General Assembly requested the index to be universal. So we have built um, uh, variables into the index to allow for comparability across the country, 195 uh, countries and, and territories. And um, in all of those analyses, uh, seeds are predominantly uh, present in the first uh, 30 countries on top of vulnerabilities. With the MVI, as again, this is a metric to complement the GNI per capita, we will be able to distinguish among countries that are, part of, that are at the same level of GNI per capita or the same income group and better understand the needs. And the needs would be uh, primarily uh, financing, development financing needs that we aim to assess. And um, in our analysis, we uh, have been able to identify strong linkages between the level of the MVI and progress against the SDGs. And I'm referring to uh, primarily human development SDGs, poverty, the well being, including health and life expectancy, uh, food security, and a series of um, other SDG outcomes. So the uh, very clear inverse proportionality with higher vulnerability, lower SDG progress has been um, identified, resulted from our multiple analysis. The very aim of the MDI is then to be able to tailor financing instruments for uh, countries um, based on, on their drivers of vulnerability. And in the case of seeds, of course, we look into insurance and guarantee uh, mechanisms we know some of the seeds have moved forward into creating uh, legal uh, mechanisms to um, seek um, compensations. We also want to ensure that the ODA uh, is not declining as countries go up the ladder in terms of income per capita and primarily access to concessional financing. But we hope the index will be used for that restructuring, that relief, as well as for some of the uh, innovative instruments, the green, the blue, the, uh, the SDG bonds, um, and uh, primarily looking into the parametric insurance that is necessary as countries aim to have access to um, more debt, again, through uh, specific uh, tailored bonds. Just to mention that while, of course, countries will move in making such financing instruments, we would like to um, clarify seeds continue to be in need of ODA. The level of ODA per capita in the GNI per capita is very high across seeds. So while we look into innovative financing development, traditional development financing needs to continue. Next slide, and that will be very, very quick. In our analysis, and again, I'll mention the methodology, but just to uh, clarify that one of the first findings is that what matters to SDG progress using uh, the SDG index that as the SN is producing is primarily the government expenditure per capita. So I'm referring to public outlays, expenditure that the governments are making in key areas, uh, human development related areas, as well as into fundamentally needed um, infrastructure. And that um, 
uh, in that regard, looking into uh, from what level of the public expenditure per capita progress against the SDGs using the SDG index of SDSN is being made, we have identified that um, from 10,000 US dollars per capita, again, PPP adjusted, countries are um, moving uh, much faster uh, towards uh, the SDGs. So we would like to ensure that governments will have access to such resources to be able to continue public financing. And uh, uh, you can see the uh, chart that we've presented here to um, showcase how increasing expenditure per capita is actually supporting faster SDG progress, SDG score using the SDG index of SDSN. Next slide, and I'll, I'll finish quickly as I can see Professor Sachs has joined. We um, are fully aware, again, I'm talking about the broad UN team covering small island states that uh, the chronic underfinancing is undermining SDG progress. Uh, the minister uh, spoke very uh, eloquently about that. And um, we also see a very, very high correlation between the uh, spending, public spending per capita in countries that are at the lowest level of public outlays uh, and the SDG score. In average, as you can see in that chart, seed are, seeds are uh, spending 5,000 US dollars per capita, whereas the most optimal score uh, above which we have um, uh, 40 countries, some 40 countries would be 18,000 US dollars per capita. Obviously governments of, of seeds would not have such resources unless as a result of the MVI and of the SDG gap uh, uh, measurement, we will um, advance towards uh, changing uh, rules for access to development financing. Next slide. This is my last, so I'll be very quick. There are different approaches in measuring the SDG financing gap, just to make very clear the vulnerability resilience country profiles that are being requested by the same um, uh, General Assembly resolution for us would employ the SDG framework as the resilience framework of every country. We don't need to invent any other definition. The SDG framework was developed to um, be a measurement of um, a progress made towards resilience. Uh, in that regard, uh, there are multiple uh, ways in which the SDG um, financing gap is being measured. The top-down approaches, the input-output approaches, the forecasting based on elasticities. Uh, panelists will speak to that. Maybe just to mention that um, the uh, objective, uh, ultimate objective is not to just have the measurement, but to design the instruments that uh, countries need, uh, seeds and non-seeds. In our approaches, we have uh, used uh, two ways uh, for, for the time being, the regression-based approach in which we practically assess the gap in government expenditure uh, without identifying items of expenditure. So we talk about the government expenditure uh, in general and uh, as a share of uh, GDP against, um, compared with the SDG index score that countries are making, the second of, uh, methodology that we are using is more of a bottom-up process that um, identifies public expenditure per SDGs. We are using the six transformation framework uh, of SDSN, and I'm sure Professor Sachs will speak to that, and um, a series of other methodologies that have been developed, including the SDG index by SDSN. And um, we will also use uh, the COFAC data, the expenditure by functions of government of the IMF to cross-validate the, the data that is being collected uh, at the uh, country level. And uh, in two weeks from now, there will be a technical note uh, that we will issue together with SDSN on the approach to measuring the SDG financing gap. And we look forward to the adoption of the report of the MVI and our work will continue. The MVI is just the beginning. And with that, I'm very pleased to uh, give the floor to our distinguished um, guests uh, today, our partner, our mentor into the development of the MVI, a university professor at Columbia University and director of the uh, Center for Sustainable Development, as well as president of SDSN. I can't continue introducing Professor Sachs without 
uh, embarrassment as Professor Sachs does not need any introduction. So thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for joining. The floor is yours. Simona, thank you. And uh, thanks to all the participants and uh, apologies for a very shaky uh, uh, broadband connection uh, today. Uh, but uh, let's hope that uh, it lasts uh, long enough for me to uh, make a few remarks to add to Simona's uh, wonderful presentation just now. The SDGs uh, at the core are an investment agenda and uh, investment needs finance. And this is uh, today the big puzzle of how the sustainable development goals can be achieved, uh, especially in low income, lower middle income and highly vulnerable economies where the means of financing the needs are desperately short of uh, the, the magnitude of the investment needs. Uh, as Simona mentioned uh, briefly, SDSN works with a six uh, transformation framework uh, that uh, organizes the investment needs into six broad categories. They are very familiar to you. They are uh, education and skill development and R&D for all. That's transformation number one, basically around education and skills. SDG uh, transformation number two is health for all. Uh, transformation number three <coughs> is green economy, uh, especially the energy transformation uh, electrification, obviously for all, but based on low carbon energy and all of the rest of the investments that are needed to cut industrial pollution and to reach the net zero greenhouse emissions by mid-century. Transformation number four is sustainable agriculture and sustainable land use and coping with the adaptation challenges coming from the ongoing climate change. Transformation number five is the whole range of urban infrastructure in a world in which developing countries are urbanizing very rapidly and another 2 billion or so people will join the urban society by mid-century. And transformation number six is investing in the digital society. Well, the main point is if you want schools and clinics and energy and uh, sustainable agriculture and cities that function and uh, digital access for society, you have to make investments. And the investments can't wait for development because these investments are key inputs for development. You don't say, well, we'll invest in quality schooling after we develop because there won't be development unless the children are learning properly. Uh, you don't uh, wait for uh, economic development before electrification because electricity is a absolutely fundamental input for development. Well, this is all quite obvious, except that the world doesn't work in a way consistent with the being obvious. Here we have the global commitment to the sustainable development goals, but for a very large part of the world, the sustainable development goals are simply out of reach because the level of investment needed in order to ensure all children in school, everybody with health care, electrification for all, uh, sustainable land use, uh, sustainable cities, digital access, it's just too expensive for a poor country to afford. And it's really sad that the IMF and the World Bank and other institutions sign agreements with countries that leave these countries impoverished or sign agreements with uh, small island developing states facing huge challenges of climate change that they didn't cause. And nobody says, oh, well, that is such a major investment challenge. Uh, we're going to ensure that you have the investment needed to accomplish this. For several years, SDSN has been 
trying to use <clears throat> various kinds of analytics and also working with the IMF to understand how big are the investment needs and how can they be met. Well, in terms of how to meet investment needs, there really are only a few ways. One is that you can invest out of the national budget, but in a poor country, the budget resources are very small. Uh, you can try to mobilize private capital, but private capital doesn't come if there is an infrastructure and skilled work. So there's a kind of vicious circle. <clears throat> or uh, you can mobilize international capital. ODA, official development aid, is supposed to be one part of that, but rich countries are stingy. So the ODA is less than half of even the small amount that has been promised year after year for decades, the 0.7% of the gross national income of the rich countries. My country, the United States, one of the stingiest countries, it, it doesn't even reach 0.2 of 1% of national income in development aid. It's about 0.17 of 1% right now really pathetic and, and sad, uh, just a demonstration of lack of global solidarity. But in general, for most of the rich countries, just not doing what needs to be done. So the other way is to borrow internationally. And for a long time, uh, development advisors and partners, not me, but others said, oh, go borrow on the capital markets, big capital markets, go borrow from business. But if you tap the euro bond market as a lower middle income country without investment grade, which almost none of them has, you'd end up paying 10% interest on a seven-year loan. Well, try developing in seven years and try to repay at 10% the interest rates. You end up bankrupt or insolvent or in a liquidity crisis. And that's what has happened to so many developing countries that were told by the World Bank or the IMF or others, go borrow on international capital markets. So here's the deal. There's not enough financing. The terms from the private markets is completely inadequate. The result is one of two uh, approaches. One approach says, okay, we'll live without electricity. Okay, we won't have kids in school. It's, it's unbelievable in the 21st century that this remains a fact of life for more than 2 billion people. Or, okay, we'll borrow at any cost, and then you end up in a debt crisis. So we need a proper way of SDG financing, and we need the SDG financing to be honed to the needs of each country because this is a global deal. So if the countries are especially vulnerable, there are small island states, for example, very hard hit by climate change, you can't apply one size fits all principles and say, no, no, you graduated, you don't get aid. What we need to do systematically, analytically is say, okay, here's the investments needed by this country in the six transformations, and this is what they would cost. And here's what the domestic budget can cover. Here's what's coming in through private capital. And then there's a gap. And the gap needs to be filled by development finance of one kind or another. Now, that leads me to the question, how are we going to fill the gap? Because the gap is actually probably close to a trillion dollars a year if you add up all of the developing country needs that can't otherwise be met. A trillion sounds like a pretty big number and a trillion is a big number. But remember the world economy is $110 trillion of annual output. The US economy by itself is almost $25 trillion. So when we talk about a trillion dollars of incremental financing for all the developing countries, we're talking about 1% of world output. In other words, if we cared, and we, we do care, but if rich country politicians cared, this would not even be a heavy lift. But it is a heavy lift because power, stinginess, greed, ignorance, it's uh, pervasive 
uh, in the world right now. And so we need a massive campaign of awareness, of understanding, and of economic justice to say we need a massive increase of development finance. It is urgent. It's becoming even more urgent with pandemics, climate shocks, war, sanctions, you name it. Developing countries are reeling from all of these shocks. And we need an SDG stimulus now. Well, with Simona, with colleagues at the UN, uh, with the UN leadership, with the Bretton Woods institutions, I'm involved in a number of processes to mobilize at least hundreds of billions of dollars per year of incremental financing to meet the needs for climate change, climate adaptation, high vulnerability, and the SDG transformation agenda. There are a number of ways that this funding could come. One of the most promising is a massive increase of long-term loans from the multilateral development banks like the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Andean Development Fund, uh, the uh, European Investment Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the uh, Islamic Development Bank, and others. In other words, all these banks together currently have annual lending of about $120 billion a year, but it should be, I would say, at least $500 billion a year. It turns out that a small amount of paid in capital can go a long way. For 20 or $40 billion, we could get an increment of maybe four or 500 billion a year. Well, let me pause here to say, we need increased investment based on country needs. We need it now, especially in a period of tightening private capital rising interest rates, war, sanctions, and pandemic. That's the agenda. We need to use new instruments like the multidimensional vulnerability index, but also the straightforward, excellent measurements that the IMF has been making in recent years to identify the unmet SDG financing needs but instead of only identifying that we have unmet needs in several hundred billion dollars, it is now urgent to close that gap. We have the G20 finance ministers meeting just now. The G20 will be in November. COP27 will be hosted by uh, the government of Egypt in Sharm el-Sheikh at the beginning of November. Then Indonesia hosts the G20 in Bali in mid-November. This is the opportunity to get our system fixed. And that's what we're working towards. So thank you very much. I hope the uh, connectivity was, uh, was okay. Apologies again for coming in late and I turn it back over to the, uh, the panelists for this uh, excellent meeting. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs. Uh, I'll transfer the floor to Dr. Massa just to thank you very much and to also express our hopes. Uh, that this is the year in which access to development financing will be redefined. Colleagues, if you want to read a new approach to global financing, there is a distinct chapter in the uh, Sustainable Development Report 2022 that uh, SDSN has issued. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Massa, over to you. Simona, thanks uh, Professor Sachs for this enlightening discussion and thanks also to you Simona for uh, your presentation on all the work that uh, you are doing with all the seats resident coordinators on both the MBI and on addressing the issue of measuring the SDG financing in uh, small island developing states. So I'm now on our, or let's move on to our uh, second uh, speaker of panel one. So I'm now honored to welcome Dr. Valerie Serra. Uh, she's uh, the assistant director in the fiscal affairs department of uh, the International Monetary Fund. She has uh, published uh, extensively on uh, several different uh, topics uh, ranging uh, from international macroeconomics uh, to financial crisis, uh, economic scarring, as well as uh, inclusive growth 
both. So we are re really pleased uh, um, to have her with us today. Uh, so uh, Valerie, can you uh, briefly tell us uh, about the work that the IMF is doing on SDG costing and uh, on other SDG uh, related issues? Uh, over to you, Valerie, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, here I will share the presentation. Yeah, so the um, previous speakers mentioned the urgency and the importance of uh, financing for sustainable development. The IMF contributes in many ways through lending, surveillance, and capacity development. I'm going to focus my uh, remarks here on some work we've done, as was as uh, Professor Sachs just mentioned, on measuring the uh, financing, costing and measuring the financing gap and, and the framework for that. Uh, so in recent years, the, the IMF has done extensive work in uh, developing methodologies costing needs. So I, I list here a few of the key publications that have come out in recent years, even before the um, before the financial crisis, uh, sorry, before the, uh, the crisis of the um, pandemic, there was work on costing the five of the key SDGs uh, intended for uh, public expenditure, ones that contribute most to public expenditure. There was additional work done uh, to assess the post-pandemic situation for these same uh, sustainable development goals. And I also highlight here the uh, recent working paper, which is focusing particularly on small developing states with climate vulnerabilities. And so the methodology includes costing, measuring the gaps along five key dimensions. In addition to that, uh, really embedding this within a, a medium term and long term framework to measure the different uh, financing gaps and, and put it in the context of revenue mobilization, economic growth, and other related macro um, variables. So. Uh, just to give illustrate for a moment the framework. So these publications and these uh, estimates are, are based on a dynamic macro model, which includes private resources. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a, a lot of work that has done that is focused in particular on both human and physical capital. Uh, SDGs, measuring the, the gaps in education and health and among the infrastructures, water, uh, roads and power in particular. This is a growth model. So the variables are all uh, related to one another to the development of government revenue um, and to the different measures of different means of financing these gaps, either through domestic revenue mobilization through domestic land, uh, domestic instruments and through international lending. Uh, so to highlight, for example, some of the results, this I show you here is from the recent publication for small developing states, those with climate vulnerabilities where you see for the different uh, income categories, the average estimates of needs in percent of GDP, in percent of 2030 GDP, um, by the five main sectors, energy, roads, water and sanitation and hygiene, health and education. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the, it's a uh, quite uh, evenly split between human and physical capital needs. Uh, and on average for these 25 small developing states, the average need is about 6.7% of GDP, but obviously it, it varies considerably by, um, by country. So this work, uh, we are continuing with this work this work uh, draws extensively on international indices. So uh, the multi 
the uh, new index being developed will be of great uh, use as an input. And uh, we're extending the work in particular uh, to incorporate climate, climate vulnerabilities, adaptation and mitigation needs. And with that, I, I want to mention an additional initiative along these dimensions. This is a, a pilot program that the IMF is currently uh, working on, which is called the Climate Macroeconomic Assessment Program. And so far, there have been two pilot cases. Um, Samoa was the first one, and Madagascar the second one. Um, and this is really looking at assessing the climate macroeconomic situation along many dimensions. But the macroeconomic implications are, are critical. So this incorporates long-term projections of the impact of climate change, the needs for resilient investment uh, to meet the SDGs, and uh, incorporates other elements too, like um, improvements in public financial management, um, risk management, uh, and uh, focuses both on adaptation and mitigation plans. So this incorporates macroeconomic modeling and what, where we intend to move forward from here is to further develop the macro financial framework for the SDGs by incorporating various elements of climate, both in terms of any upfront mitigation investment that would be required to transition to a greener energy mix, as well as many dimensions of adaptation that also, by the way, impact the achievement of other SDGs because they interact with education and health, in particular health. Um, and of course, the, the costs of uh, providing access to water and electricity and roads also must incorporate climate vulnerability to uh, ensure that the investment is resilient to uh, potential climate hazards. So I will uh, stop there and um, happy to take any questions uh, later. Valerie, thank you so much uh, for uh, all uh, this uh, explanation on the great work that the IMF uh, is doing on measuring uh, the additional financing, uh, spending needs to achieve the SDGs uh, and also on other issues related to the SDGs. So thank you so much. And now uh, let me uh, make a slight change in our agenda. Uh, we are going to include in this panel uh, Professor uh, Perso that will was supposed uh, to uh, be part of panel two because uh, he has uh, to left uh, and unfortunately we have uh, a bit of delay. Uh, so uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Avinash Perso, who is Emeritus Professor of Gresham College and also Special Envoy to the Prime Minister of Barbados on Investment and um, Financial Services. Uh, Avinash has a great experience uh, on uh, international finance, on investment, uh, so we are really delighted uh, to uh, hear from him and uh, we know that he also would like uh, to say something about uh, the um, MBI, the Multidimensional Vulnerability Index. So over to you, Avinash, the floor is yours. Great, good, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, let me thank you, uh, you, Isabella, for your wonderful uh, uh, organizing of today and, and this event and all the hard work you and the team have been putting in uh, on these uh, quite important issues. Um, and I apologize, I, I have to, to leave early. Uh, we, we in the Caribbean, as you know, um, have the most expensive um, transport in the region. And we are in the middle of some intense negotiations on trying to introduce a, a fast ferry system uh, to move people and cargo. Uh, and uh, unfortunately those negotiations are going on at the moment, uh, this, this minute. Um, <clears throat> we all know why we're here. The issue uh, of um, achieving the uh, sustainable development goals, the financing gap to achieve 
the sustainable development goals, the vi most vital issues to humanity today. But of course, uh, for those of us on the front line, those of us in vulnerable states, in, in countries with, uh, with uh, su substantial poor people and, and poverty, um, we're not interested in, in, in virtuous positioning. Uh, the professionals around this table are not interested in virtuous positions. We need actual progress. So we need to identify the obstacles to progress and find solutions to progress. Let me say a few words about the multidimensional vulnerability index. It's, this is a topic I have, uh, I, I have personal interest. Uh, my father was one of the very first people to commission uh, research on the vulnerability of small island development states uh, when a number of them began becoming graduated uh, by the World Bank. And this was, uh, this was in the mid 1980s when the idea uh, that vulnerability and small states was really very fresh. Uh, and if you if you look back at the very beginning of this debate, uh, it begins with that with those first commission reports. We we think ultimately this is an empirical question. The question we're trying to ask is how do we come up with a measure uh, of vulnerability that that is not captured in in the GNI. So we're actually not. This is a very uh, so so that's to the the main task, and let's and we really need to see the results. Uh, because there are a few multidimensional vulnerability indices around, uh, some of them that have been produced and we've seen results, um, uh, do not actually achieve the task uh, of identifying the special vulnerabilities uh, of small island development states for the universal indices. And we believe there are three fundamental reasons why that's happening. And we are very... Uh, uh, supportive and encouraging of the uh, efforts uh, being done by the UN, but we, we believe there are three fundamental issues uh, that, uh, that the MVI will need to deal with. Um, the first one is we're trying to complement GNI. So we're really looking at, at vulnerabilities that are intrinsically different than what is already captured in GNI. And of course, um, the problem is that when we start including economic vulnerabilities, and I think you, you've made a wise choice in removing some of the social uh, vulnerabilities, not because they're not important, but because they're outcomes. Uh, but when, when we start increasing the number of vulnerabilities that we include, you actually find you begin to converge on something very similar to GNI in terms of the ranking of countries. Uh, and the, the work we have done has, been, has shown that the more you increase multi-dimensions, and poverty is a multi-dimensional, and vulnerability is a multi-dimensional activity, the more you end up with a rank that looks similar to GNI. And so we're not achieving the task, which is to identify those vulnerabilities that are orthogonal, are, are different uh, than GNI. Um, and indeed, you know, small island development states, we believe we are highly vulnerable. But when you go universal, you start looking at vulnerabilities of a large number of countries uh, that we don't have, that they have. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa has a set of vulnerabilities that are real and genuine, that need to be in, a, in any universal index that we don't have. And when you start looking universally, uh, you will find uh, that it does not really change the position of the small island development states in the debate for more development financing relative to other countries because of a unique set of vulnerabilities. I think the second issue is that as you become more complicated and involve more multi-dimensions, you're gonna have methodological debates. There will be people who will say, well, my index is different than your index and there'll be other indices and there will be a whole uh, wealth of indices. We're never gonna have one index. We're going to have a set of indices, maybe, that people prefer, but there will be other indices. There will always be an aspiring academic looking for tenure who will come up with another index. Uh, and so I think the more we go multidimensional, the more we can have methodological debates and potentially be drowned by methodological debates. The third issue is that you need something that, at the end of the day, we are seeking a political purpose. We're seeking a purpose which allows, uh, uh, allows us to achieve a greater share of development finance because of genuine vulnerabilities. It has to be compelling. And 
if you come up with a multi multi-dimensional vulnerability index and you come up with a number, then no one can really tell you exactly how that number is, uh, is come up, uh, developed, uh, and it includes many, many things, it's not, it is not compelling. It is not something that people will feel. Um, and I think that's gonna make it hard, especially when we know today that when we talk about the SDGs, when we talk about poverty and the genuine issues of vulnerability, finance is not there. And so the more we, we have a, a non-compelling number, is it, cl is it clear that it will uh, impact uh, our political task of getting more development financing? And that is why we await the numbers. We wish to see the universal index and how it comes out. But we wish to raise our belief that there's some fundamental inherent challenges in this route achieving what we want to achieve. It may become a very good measure of vulnerability, but it may not achieve what we wish to achieve. We believe that something far more compelling, and this was raised by your IMF um, uh, 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 speaker, raised by our great mentor uh, uh, and person of, of, uh, who's inspired us, Jeff Sachs, climate vulnerability. SIDS come top of the class on climate vulnerability. Climate vulnerability is compelling. People understand it. People see it. Climate vulnerability will be a way, we think, an easier way in which SIDS can get a greater share of development financing. We therefore encourage and support the work the IMF is doing on the climate macroeconomic assessment. We think it's very real. We think, and let me move on to the last couple of minutes of my conversation on financing options. We believe not only is climate vulnerability compelling, not only is it real, not only is it the only subject today in the global arena in which people are putting more money towards. Where do you have a debate of 192 countries meeting every year at COP, for instance, where they're discussing financing mechanisms of tens and hundreds of billions of dollars? We should be having that on poverty, on inequality, on access to pure, uh, 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 portable water, but we don't. So climate vulnerability is not only compelling, it, it, SIDS are not only vulnerable to the climate, but it is the one door that is open in finance. So I believe we should go through that door. We should come up with an indicator of climate vulnerability. Now, let me end by saying that the purpose of, uh, of what we're trying to do is say there are a set of countries that are not LDCs who have access to concession funding but have a degree of vulnerabilities that suggest they should be. And that means we're talking about essentially middle-income countries. And the middle-income financing options, and of course, as you know, 75% of the world's poor, 75% of the world's poor do not live in LDCs. So if we are concerned about the poor and the poverty as we, as we are, then in fact, we do need to think about how we look at, uh, at middle-income countries. So we're looking at a middle-income country problem, and that's very different than an LDC problem. I'm not saying that the LDC problem is not something we should look at, but debt cancellation works for LDCs. It does not work for middle-incomes. Middle-income countries, which are involved in the private credit markets and need more and more financing going forward. So uh, we think that we need uh, to widen the eligibility of concessional financing to include climate vulnerability. It's simple, it's compelling, it's got political status in today's world. We think we can win that. We think we can win that at COP27 and COP28. Whilst we have been struggling for decades to win what we should have won, which is more financing for the MDGs and now the SDGs. Secondly, we think the development banks, like Jeff Sachs said, should be given more ability to lend for the concessional financing. We believe that is about small amounts of additional capital. We believe they should be able to hold SDRs and to be able to count that as part of their capital to raise more funding. 50 to 100 billion of SDRs could get us to the kind of half trillion per year of extra funding we need from the, from the multilateral development banks. Thirdly, we're talking about middle-income countries. 
in the capital markets, we need different types of debt instruments. We recommend the Barbados style natural disaster clauses. We are pushing for Britain and Canada and America to also issue the same structured bonds. If all of the world had Barbados style natural disaster clauses, when the COVID crisis happened, developing countries would have had access to $1 trillion of liquidity. $1 trillion of liquidity. There is no alternative financing option that would have given them that. Uh, and as you know about the disaster clauses, for two years, your debt is suspended. It's added back on to the end of the term uh, with interest. So this is not a bet on a disaster. You'll get your, the net present value is the same. It's about providing liquidity at a time of a disaster. And finally, you know, we need loss and damage funds. Uh, we know that the, th these funds need to be grants. Uh, they cannot be loans. You cannot go to a Dominica who's lost 200% of their GDP in four hours uh, and say, here's a loan. Uh, we need grants. Now, the world does not have grants to give. Uh, we need to have, uh, we need to, to channel all the grants into loss and damage. We should not be using grants for climate mitigation. The private sector can finance that. We should not be using uh, uh, grants for climate adaptation. We need concessional funding from the MDBs for that. We need grants for loss and damage. But we need to supplement those with a 2% levy on the consumption of fossil fuels to go into a loss and damage financing facility. Uh, and that would support all countries uh, suffering from a, from a climate, uh, climate vulnerability. Let me end there. I apologize for being difficult and inconvenient when people have done so much hard work, but we are anxious that we are not going to achieve what we want to achieve uh, when it comes to the, the multi-dimensional vulnerability index. We believe we can achieve what we want to achieve by focusing on climate vulnerability. We believe we need new financing instruments, the Barbados style natural disaster clauses, more concessional funding with SDRs and a loss and damage facility. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Avinash, for all these insights on the NVI and also on the issue of STP financing and the importance of focusing on climate vulnerability and developing, uh, I mean, uh, new tools for addressing uh, this issue of vulnerability. Thank you so much. And uh, given uh, the tight uh, schedule that we have, uh, let me move directly to the next speaker um, of a panel one as well. So I'm now honored to introduce uh, Mr. Paul Akivumi, uh, who is uh, the director of UNCTA, the Division for Africa, Least Developed Countries uh, and the Special Programs. So Paul has extensive experience in the area of development policy among several other areas. And uh, in addition to this, uh, he oversees uh, the work on uh, the Least Developed Countries Report, which is uh, one of UNCTAD uh, flagship uh, publications. So uh, Paul, is UNCTAD using any specific method to gauge financing gap in LDCs? And do you have any specific thoughts in relation to small islands and developing states. So over to you, Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, and thank you very much for having me and, and for listening to the previous speakers has been very interesting and, and thought provoking. Um, I think it, moving forward, uh, one first, I believe, with regard to financing, I think one has to recognize the, the true scale of, of the problem that we're in. And this was mentioned partly by Jeffrey Sachs and others. But I think it's worth reiterating, and I think it's worth also mentioning additional areas that we have to consider, which we have not been considering. And uh, we all recognize that we're going through a cost of living crisis, a food crisis, and the price of fuel has gone up, but, and then also the COVID pandemic. But I think we also have recognized that in, today, there are over 50% of the SIDS which are in debt stress or almost in debt stress and over 60% of LDCs which are in the same condition that they are in now, um, um, debt stress. But I think what is missing also that we have to consider is that there are many international, major international agreements and events which have implications on countries achieving the SDGs and financing of the SDGs. MC12, which just concluded, has major implications with regard to the agriculture subsidies compliance for LDCs and LLDCs and SIDS. Also with regard to illegal unregulated fishing, 
the compliance regulation. These are additional burdens which are going to be put on these countries and require additional financing for that. I think it's also important to recognize that in this global economy and this political economy that's going on, there are economic partnership agreements which are being drawn up. And these economic partnership agreements have considerable uh, 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 regulatory frameworks and, and issues which LDCs and, and SIDS have to comply with as well. Um, so these are some of the areas I think we need to also consider. And, and lastly, just to mention that the European Union with their trade and, and uh, sustainable development provisions of the European Union trade agreement, which was just adopted in June, 2022, places additional burdens on countries. So it is not just about the global context in the sense of the, 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 the shocks that are going on, but it's about us recognizing the international agreements that member states are signing and the implications will have, and therefore the implications of costs on the LDCs and SIDS. Example of this is if you're moving towards a low carbon economy, you know, there are four important shifts that will happen. If you have a changing global demand pattern, you will have evolving regulatory frameworks, which I mentioned, but you have an increase in the new generation of technologies, but also you'll have an appetite for more sustainable investment. And although this will all provide naturally some green opportunities for LDCs and everything in vulnerable countries. Um, it is important to note that they will also have negative consequences on sectoral parts of their economy, uh, which could, which is important here if they're not getting the financing, which could entrench them, you know, even further and marginalize them even further in participating in the global trade uh, and in production. And of course, environmental conventions that we are actively all signing and we all aspire to and find important. They are meeting their strict standards and, and uh, monitoring regulations and tracking to combat climate change. So there's a lot happening. In fact, it, it's ironic because I, I, I fly Swiss Air quite often and they had just sent an email to all their, their, their frequent flyers indicating that they're having big problems in having the capacity and social capacity to start taking on the regulatory arrangement that the EU has provided. So if that's Swiss Air is saying that, what about all the other airlines of all the other developing countries around the world? So I think these are critical things that we have to, to bear in mind because these global agreements have legally binding conditions related to them. And uh, they create, as I mentioned, more burden, more cost, uh, with regard to resources, with regard to human capacity. And then the question comes in here about just transition, just transition into a greener economy. And this is critical for member states to recognize this so that they can provide the right policies to ensure that this happens. Now for my intervention here, I'll quickly just mention, focus on two key areas. It's about external debt, which I mentioned earlier on, of of these uh, SIDS and, and LLDCs and least developed countries, which is critical. And secondly, how do we have sort of tried to calculate in some way the SDGs uh, that we believe are necessary for in, uh, to achieve structural transformation. Now, as we've heard from our previous speakers, the natural disasters are key element of concern for SIDS. And uh, we estimate that uh, they, they, on average, it costs them 2.1% of their GDP every year. And so this, this is critical, but it's not just about the reconstruction requirements for which requires mass, massive financial uh, resources, but it's also, uh, uh, it's, it's, which is also done through external borrowing. But it's also more importantly, it's about the financial costs um, of post-disaster recovery, not just the post-disaster, like I mentioned, but it's also the pre-disaster financing. So this is another critical area which we've identified, which was required for resilience building. Um, it's also important because a lot of this is which is happening now, the borrowing that is going on, the capacity to absorb the financing to deal with the reconstruction caused by the natural disaster is another issue. But also the fact that less funding is being available for the social programs of the country and this leads to more complications with regard to the, the uh, just transition 
and uh, the people of those countries. Now, um, so therefore, we, we, we strongly believe also there needs to be a stronger multilateral cooperation and greater flexibility uh, with regard to ass assessing the pre and post financial instruments, but also the financial instruments that are required. We, we strongly believe at this point in time that the financial mechanisms that have been put in place have never been adequate. And because of these compounded additional requirements that have been put on, 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 on SIDS and, and LDCs, they certainly needs to be looked at uh, as a new way of moving forward. But then again, also, it's important that governments look within themselves and within the policies they have and try and address some of the problems to be able to, to bolster their uh, domestic resource mobilization. And here with SIDS, financial leakages are considerable in the tourism sector. We estimate about 60% of the, uh, of the of financing stays outside the country. And, and this is important that they have the right uh, uh, policies to put in place to ensure that they get the greatest benefit from from this uh, from this tourism industry. Um, this this comes in many, the leakages come in many forms. It's simply booking, making bookings of tourists going to to those uh, that region. Sixty percent stays outside the country. Forty percent goes into the country. It's about the goods and services provided for the tourism sector most of them being net importers, it's all being imported. So there needs to be a backward linkage into the economy and it has to drive that economy to be able to, 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 be able to deal with the leakage and reduce the leakages. Um, I think also what is, is, is clear that um, with, the, with the servicing of the debt that's going on in, in SIDS and, and least developed countries, the majority of the debt servicing of the of the debt, uh, the, I'm sorry, the majority of government expenditure is going to the servicing of the debt, and there's very little left money left for any other development policies. Um, right now, uh, we estimate that, uh, like I said, 19 out of 38 SIDS are either in debt stress or going through debt stress right now, and uh, with LDCs, 17 are high stress, five are in, in debt stress, and 17 are always in immediate stress. So it's, it's important that we try and move along how to manage the, the debt. And UNCTAD has a, a, a number of recommendations how we are helping countries do it. And one thing is to help countries with our tools, innovative tools, is to build the financial transparency uh, and support domestic resource mobilization. And with the domestic resource mobilization, we have an innovative tool, which is Automated Systems for Customs Data, a Secuda program, which is designed to assist member states in reforming their customs regime, their procedures, their systems uh, in line with international standards, but more importantly also to improve the efficient collection and management of government revenues. And then we have our debt management and financial systems uh, which also helps countries strengthen their capacity to manage their debt. And it also assists in the monitoring reporting to the IMF on the standards. And we believe that bolstering international support, uh, in bolstering international support, support these countries is critical. And there is, okay. I, I will finish very shortly. Yes, so, sorry to, yes, thanks. If you cannot conclude because we are really running out of time. Uh, so thank you. Yes, and so to to also, as uh, as our previous speaker mentioned about the insurance factor, the importance of that, and we're working with the V20 to try and move that agenda, and also about economic diversification, and that we believe is a very strong part, and that's why we have our, our multi-dimensional uh, uh, productive capacity index. But the important thing about this is not just when you get the financing, whether you have the capacity to produce goods and services. And this is an index which measures that capacity to produce goods and services. So that's also critical. And for many island states, the importance of the blue economy. And it's not just about the fisheries and the tourism and the transport, it's about bioprospecting. It's about high value wind, it's about nutraceuticals, it's about the pharmaceutical industry, it's about the cosmetic industry. So these are some of the key areas that I think we need to, the, the, the thing about quickly on just two things is that the approach we use to measure some of the SDGs, 
want critical areas that we didn't look at all SDGs. We just looked at the SDGs that we believe can support structural transformation. And we were able to look at forecasting that and be able to look at how we can uh, 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 come up with figures about how we can improve those SDGs. And they are in the multi-millions. I won't go through them, but you can check on our online um, 2019 uh, least developed country report, which has a methodology and also the different SDGs. But it's quite clear that both the important aspect of this is that we looked at how structural transformation can be achieved. And I think that's one of the key things. It's not just about receiving financing, it's about using that financing in an effective way to build the resilience of these countries. So let me end there and uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, um, I will have to leave soon. I have another engagement, but uh, happy to take any questions if they arise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for all these insights and for all the work that UNCTAD is doing and that represent a key contribution to the international community effort to construct a more promising developmental horizon for poor countries, especially in the post-pandemic decade. So now uh, I thank you again, all the speakers of panel one, and I will now pass the floor to the UN resident coordinator for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean, Mr. Didier Trebuk, who will moderate uh, panel two. So over to you, Didier. Good morning, good morning or good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, very interesting and thoughtful uh, debate so far, I must say. Uh, so we're now moving on to the second panel, which will uh, address the issue on how to finance the SDGs and here are some lessons learned and recommendations on the way forward. So this is a good transition given that we have heard about the methodologies to better measure the SDG financing gap and vulnerability. Um, so we are a bit late uh, in the program, but we'll make sure that uh, we take the necessary time to hear all presenters that are here today. Um, and if time permits, we'll take also some question and answers. Uh, what I would like to request before uh, reminding the, the, the lead question is that intervention can be done within the context of the high level panel, uh, finalizing recommendations to develop uh, new metrics to account for vulnerabilities and the beyond GDP agenda that the UN Secretary General is spearheading. Uh, and this can also be done within the context of the UN Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy and Finance and the working group that the Deputy Secretary General has set up with Professor Jeff uh, Sachs on financing the, the SDGs. So let me turn to the, the, the lead question. And as you know, we're midterm of the Agenda 2030 and following the COVID pandemic and now the triple crisis, the progress to achieve the SDGs, of course, seems to be almost stagnating in many places. Some countries are losing years of development gain despite commitments and resources being invested. And uh, as we have seen in the panel one and some of the presentations done and our, our analysis showed that to a large extent progress is not being sustained due to limited financial resources that countries have access to and especially uh, countries with high vulnerabilities such as SEEDS or LDC. So I would like to, to ask you first, uh, what would be your advice that you can give to government or multilateral development banks, for example, as to how to secure or make available the necessary resources to continue the sustainable uh, development journey at this time of multiple challenges? And second, uh, what would fundamentally change or should fundamentally change in the global financing system to close uh, this important SDG gap that was mentioned by Professor Jeffrey Sachs of about $1 trillion a year. So each panelist, you have uh, around up uh, to seven minutes to, you, to do your presentation. And uh, I will now turn to Mr. Olivier uh, Cataneo. Um, Dr. Cataneo is the head of policy analysis and strategy at the OECD. Uh, Development Cooperation Directorate is an adjunct professor at the Paris School of International Affairs in Sciences Po, and previously he has also worked at the World Bank in Washington and with the AFD. So Mr. Cataneo will share insights on what are some of the fundamental changes that need to take place in the global financing system and uh, what are the actions taken uh, at the OECD. So Dr. Cataneo, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, uh, moderator, and thanks uh, to the host for the kind invitation and uh, 
for all the fascinating, I mean, presentations so far. I will go straight to your questions and just uh, uh, point at uh, two lessons learned uh, so far uh, from uh, the financing of the SDGs and two ways forward. Uh, on the lessons learned, uh, first, I mean, uh, clearly, I mean, it's not enough. I mean, what we have on the table to finance the SDGs, it was said, and uh, it was said also that unfortunately we are going the wrong direction because the SDG financing gap is growing. Uh, this is in part the result of uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, that had um, what we called a scissors effect uh, with the growing needs and at the same time uh, dropping uh, resources. So the SDG financing gap could have increased according to our uh, calculation by more than 50% uh, since uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, the crisis has also magnified I mean, some pre-existing inequalities, uh, inequalities among countries. And to give you a, an example, uh, the per capita fiscal stimulus uh, was uh, 700 times higher in high income countries uh, than uh, in low income countries in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, access to vaccines was seven times uh, higher. But not only among countries, also within countries, we see that uh, unfortunately some communities have been more affected uh, by the crisis, such as women and children in particular. We see, for instance, that 50% of the children in sub-Saharan Africa uh, or in Oceania uh, lacked access to education uh, during, the, during the pandemic. So there is a risk of great divergence. I mean, that had been uh, evoked during the last uh, annual meetings of the World Bank and IMF, and uh, Professor Jeff Sachs, I mean, mentioned this vicious cycle of uh, of getting indebted and have, having even less resources to fight uh, the next crisis. Because we know that crises come uh, with waves, and we know that, uh, for instance, um, a health or climate crisis can trigger economic, social, and political crises that cost even more to 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 handle. Another lesson from the crisis is that uh, we saw that we are all interconnected uh, when it comes to uh, the SDG agenda. That's, that's obvious, but uh, we need to reinstate that we cannot progress, make progress on the SDGs in one country without making progress in the other countries, because you never know where the next crisis uh, will come from. Second lesson learned uh, is that unfortunately, I mean, the, the road to hell uh, might be paved with good intentions, uh, as, as we say. Uh, the, the crisis has accelerated what we call the sustainability rush, uh, which is a greater demand and supply of uh, sustainable finance on global markets. So this is a unique opportunity for SDG financing, and we need to, to, to seize it. But at the same time, the preliminary uh, evidence we have collected shows that uh, this drive for sustainability has further concentrated uh, the finance in the hands on the, of a very few. Uh, to give you a few numbers, I mean, to illustrate that, we knew that 80% uh, of global assets under management were in high-income countries. So this is already pretty bad. Well, when you look at the newly uh, established sustainable finance funds, they are concentrated for 97% in high income countries, which is even worse. Uh, when you look at uh, Sub Saharan Africa, it represents only 1.5% of the green bonds, I mean, by number, and 0.3% by value. Uh, and only 8% of climate finance. Uh, mobilized for the developing countries go to the LDCs. And since we are talking a lot about the seeds, it's only 2% uh, for the seeds when we know they are the ones with uh, some of the greatest needs. So action is needed. And on the two ways forward that I will suggest, the first one uh, is to enforce what I will call the equity pillar of SDG alignment. So um, there is lots of progress made on sustainability. Uh, but if it's not needs-based and only further increases the concentration uh, of finance in a very few high-income country or emerging countries, that's not satisfactory. So we need to shift the trillions not only by going from non-sustainable to sustainable, but also by moving the frontier of a sustainable investment to include uh, the most vulnerable countries that we have been discussing today. Uh, something we are exploring at OECD, for instance, is how to go from ESG to SDG. 
for many, uh, it sounds more like a semantic change, uh, ESG to SDG, another acronym, but it's much more than that. Uh, and uh, we need in particular to, for those who claim that they are uh, SDG aligned, uh, make sure that they also commit uh, to invest a certain percentage of their assets in the most vulnerable countries. The second way forward uh, is that in order to, to, to make this shift, uh, we need uh, a collective action. Uh, we need that all actors along the investment chain uh, to take part in the change. Uh, and that's something we have explored, for instance, in the OECD, UNDP, I mean, framework for SDG uh, aligned finance. And we looked at uh, three layers of uh, adjustments that are needed. Of course, in developing countries themselves, there is a lot that needs to be done, I mean, to make them more attractive. Uh, we need to build a pipeline of bankable, sustainable projects. I mean, we need to deepen the financial markets. We need uh, to adopt sustainability reporting standards and so on. And as uh, Professor Sachs said, we need to align the financing, the budget strategies with the SDGs uh, better. But that's not enough. Uh, we need to look also at the intermediary actors, uh, business investors, and make sure uh, they have a more responsible uh, conduct. Uh, and uh, the donors also need to work with the investor to develop, I mean, uh, the risking instruments, reform the risk measure measurement uh, mechanisms uh, with systems like blended finance guarantees and so on that need to be scaled up uh, to, to make uh, it happen. And Professor Sachs also mentioned the cost, I mean, that is related obviously to those uh, practices that that needs to lower. And finally, uh, we need also to work uh, in the countries of origin of the investors to avoid the diversion of uh, finance uh, uh, away from the SDGs. For instance, when we have still uh, billions of dollars of subsidies to, to fossil fuel, uh, which is not coherent with the, with, uh, with the alignment with the SDGs. Or another point, and that's what I will conclude with, is, is the question of ESG or SDG washing that we really need to address because these are wasted opportunities. People want to make their money work for the SDGs. And unfortunately, because there are no rules uh, about the labeling, there is no monitoring, no assessment of the impact of the SDGs. The SDG targets are not necessarily appealing to the private sector. This is sort of wasted money for the SDGs and that's something that we need to address. So I will leave it here uh, for the sake of time and thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, for the time. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Um, Cataneo. Uh, ex excellent insights. Uh, lessons from the crisis that you have uh, presented and uh, reminding the concentration of finance is indeed in high income countries, so something important to be changed and some of the solutions like uh, scaling up uh, financing instrument uh, with a view also to lower the cost so, amongst others. So thank you very much uh, for this intervention. Uh, given time constraints and uh, some of the panelists that are uh, to leave, I would like to invite now uh, Ms. Uh, Josephine Pagani. She's um, former executive director of the Council for International Development. Uh, Josie Pagani has worked in aid, politics, trade, and uh, media. Uh, she was an inaugural member of the New Zealand government's Trade for All Advisory Board and uh, its Aid for Trade external group. She's been involved in uh, several progressive think tanks in UK and Europe. And uh, we thought that given your high level experience in the aid and development sector, as well as political advisory function, it will be very, very interesting to hear from you uh, today and uh, particularly some perspective from a uh, civil society angle. So uh, Ms. Pagani, you have the floor. Uh, kia ora. I'm not sure if you can see me, but um, as long as you can hear me, kia ora koutou, maloa lele, talofa lava, kia bula. Um, warm Pacific greetings. I'm, I'm actually in Austria uh, and traveling back to New Zealand. So uh, thank you so much for accommodating my um, schedule because I'm about to jump on a train and, and then catch a plane. Um, but, uh, and please let me know that the Wi-Fi should be good, but please let me know if you have any, any problems. So, um, Didier, I've turned my video on, but I, I can't seem to control it from here. Um, the host has disabled it, but shall I just carry on? Yes, carry on, please, while we try okay. to 
All right, okay. Um, so I, what I wanted to talk about, we've covered, I think, a lot of the context, the problems that we have. We're halfway to the SDGs. We are no way close to being able to fund them and, and achieve them. And um, I wanted to talk about two barriers that I think exist. One is political, the other is strategic, and then talk about what I think uh, the way forward is. Um, so politically, you know, of course we know we have COVID, we have the insecurity of war in Ukraine, food insecurity, um, the, the key thing I think for this about in terms of investment, whether it's investment from governments or whether it's investment from the private sector, is that we are predicting, and many are predicting, an increase in unrest and riots. Um, and so to quote The Economist uh, recently, they said all around the world, inflation is crushing living standards, stoking fury and fostering turmoil. We've seen it in Sri Lanka. We've seen it in our own region in the Solomons. We see it, of course, in, um, in, in the most vulnerable countries. And the thing about violence and, and um, unrest is that investors hate riots and revolutions and unrest. And there's a statistic, uh, again, from The Economist, which says that um, every big violent uh, event usually reduces GDP by about one point in the next 18 months. So we're in a very, very volatile environment. And, you know, it, there isn't much support amongst voters and citizens for the SDGs. They're not even sure what they are. And so politicians and also potential financiers, whether private or, or um, outside of government, understand this. So, you know, the question is, how do we build the social license to fund more um, and to put more funding into the SDGs. Um, I also wanted to highlight, I think, a real problem we have, which is the decline in trust for international organizations amongst voters and citizens. And the war in Ukraine has, of course, demonstrated this in a tragic way where um, the UN has been unable to respond because of the veto of the Security Council. I think what we're seeing is a lack of trust accelerating amongst citizens um, for international organizations to solve problems. And the SDGs are um, unintended victim of that thinking. Uh, but you know, we know that NATO in Europe has actually gone up in support uh, since Ukraine. I think 70% of citizens in the EU uh, have, have now support NATO. Um, but I think this is a very politically a very uh, uh, real barrier to funding the SDGs further. Um, uh, I know a statistic in the United Kingdom where now 30% of people in the UK, that's 14 million, think that they would rather have a strong leader who could bypass parliament and get things done. So that is a real worry because I think if we see an increase in political unrest in authoritarian governments, from donors, we are not going to see the funding for the SDGs uh, materialize. The second challenge is strategic. Um, and again, we've known this, all of us working in the SDGs, that there's so many of them that it's hard for politicians or, or funders or um, citizens to focus on what, what can be done. It feels like white noise to them. Um, and it's much easier to raise funding if you are saying um, net zero climate change or don't invest in fossil fuels, invest here. Um, and that's why I think we have, need to have a very clear message about what it is we're asking finance, financiers and, and other alternative vehicles for funding um, to finance which, which SDG. So summing that up, I, I now want to say what I think the winning approach is from here on in um, what we can do to, to deal with those uh, barriers. And the first one, I think, is to apply the same um, thinking that we apply to political campaigns to the SDGs. Um, and that, and I know I've mentioned this before um, at forums like this, but you know, a political campaign must have three winning things. One is edge, it must have cut through cut through into the busyness of people's lives and also cut through for potential financiers to finance the SDGs. Very specific, it needs crunch. That's the second thing, Very um, a, a very specific call to action. What is it? Is it digital connectivity? Is it uh, TB? Is it malaria? Is it infrastructure? Is it, is it um, um, uh, broadband and so on? And the third is lift. 
it has to inspire people. It has to inspire politicians and citizens, and that will also inspire funding. So the other um, uh, approach that I think is so important, I think the MVI, the index, is so incredibly important and helpful. It helps us you know, analyze the vulnerabilities as we've spoken today. But I think it also has to be combined with a very clear cost benefit analysis that will help the prioritization. And, and I know a few people have mentioned this, you know, how do we prioritize? What is the prioritization approach? And I think if you have a cost benefit analysis that allows you to work out, okay, what are the top priorities? And most importantly, that this analysis is owned locally by local governments, local civil society, local businesses, and it uses local systems wherever possible. So it's owned by the developing country, by the SID, not by the donor. Um, and I think this clear call to action in terms of the top priorities is, is the way forward. And, and I'll just give you to end a couple of examples. Um, we know in the Pacific, um, and I know uh, Simona will, uh, will agree with me here, um, that we are hearing again and again, the top priority for Pacific governments and Pacific civil society and business is digital connectivity. Uh, that is the answer for many, uh, for education, for access to markets, for access to health advice online um, and so on. So it may well be that if you go, here is the specific call to action, digital connectivity attached to the SDGs um, and, and this will make it easier to raise finance. Um, I'm working at the moment on a Bill Gates Foundation project, which is called the half time for the SDGs, where to invest best for the end game. Um, and, and this is exactly a cost benefit analysis. And we're doing this with Tonga uh, and we're also doing it, I hope to be doing it also with Samoa. Um, but this is about going, right, what are the top um, policies and SDG um, uh, 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 framed policies that you want to prioritize? And then let's do a cost benefit analysis. And critically, it will tell us also what not to put the money into straight away. So what is the top priority? Uh, one other example is the Haitian government uh, with the support of USAID, USAID launched uh, a, a food fortification project after doing this very clear cost benefit analysis. The first priority was to fortify the food. Uh, and then in Uganda, another example where the cost benefit analysis was done, the top priority was to keep schools open uh, during, during the pandemic in some way to improve the earning, future earnings of children but also to focus on malaria and tuberculosis. So there was a very clear cost benefit analysis to go, these are our top priorities. And then there are, there are priorities that may not be uh, as, as high. Um, and critically, it tells us what, what we don't necessarily need more money for, even if they're really important, like corruption, um, uh, because that might not be the best way, best place to put your money. So in conclusion, I think we need to run SDG campaigns like political campaigns with a very clear call to action, a very clear target, um, and that'll be different country to country to country. Uh, and the second priority is uh, that the, the index can be followed up with cost benefit analysis in each country and it is owned by the local country, not by the donor, not by the development bank. Um, and that will help governments to prioritize and it will help civil society to also be part of that process. Um, and I think this is the only way that we will really accelerate the urgency for the second half of our SDG period of time. Finally, my, my, I have a wonderful quote from the Prime Minister of uh, Samoa, um, Prime Minister Fiamme, who says that a return to business as usual in aid uh, pre-COVID will not be acceptable. We have to do things differently. And I think we have some great ideas here to do things differently. So kia ora, thank you for letting me jump the queue um, and I will finish there. Kia ora, kia ora tato. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pagani for those excellent insights, uh, especially for highlighting those challenges to increasing finance such as political barriers, but also uh, digital uh, connectivity. Oh, now we can see you. Good. <laughs> that, this is what I look like. <laughs> Very good. And I appreciate that you mentioned the importance of the MVI to prioritize and the uh, uh, importance of local ownership for any analysis, including cost benefit analysis. So thank you very much for your intervention today.
Um, given the time, I would like to uh, invite Ambassador uh, Lutero, Ambassador Lutero uh, is the permanent representative of uh, Samoa to the United Nations. He has a short uh, message to deliver to the group that was supposed to be at the end of the panel. Uh, but given the time, we'd like to invite him to deliver his message. Over to you, uh, Ambassador. Thank, thank you very much. And I apologize, I've got uh, some other engagement. I, I, I thought we would be sort of finished by now. Uh, but uh, allow me firstly to uh, thank all our uh, presenters and, and, and panelists and, and uh, to commend them. Uh, for the clear and insightful presentation that has been made so far. Uh, the depth and uh, breadth of uh, experience demonstrated and their knowledge of the topic cover, uh, in my view, is uh, commendable and I'd like to thank them for sharing. But I also want to say that whilst I have learned uh, new things in, in terms of our discussion today, a lot of the things are not new in terms of concern. Uh, and therefore, I think we need to see how we can actually convert some of these uh, proposals and recommendations in terms of action on the ground. Uh, moderator, I, I do not intend to perhaps uh, summarize what has already been said. I, I don't want to run the risk of offending. Uh, our panelists. Uh, so if you allow me, I would just like to focus on uh, a few uh, issues which I believe are important. Uh, firstly, just let me say that uh, Samoa is honored to be part of this conversation uh, on how SIDS can narrow the financing gap that currently exists and thereby contribute to meeting our SDGs obligations and begin the long journey to economic recovery post-COVID. Actions and common action is a strategic necessity that we need now. We cannot afford more talk shops. And urgent action is required to fuel genuine partnership and global cooperation to achieve the SDG. There is no doubt of the central role of the MVI in facilitating the path of SIDS to realize the HSDG and achieve the objective of the Paris Agreement and by extension, the Samoa pathway. The vulnerability of SIDS, we have already heard very clearly, have been well argued and advocated. From the Pacific perspective, Pacific SIDS perspective, the MVI will assist in bridging the financial divide between the developed and developing countries. The vulnerability of SIDS needs to feature more prominently in the criteria for ODA allocations, access to concessional financing, and for the establishment of an effective sovereign debt regime. If we are to make substantial progress towards the achievement of all the SDGs, we need to rethink our means of implementation at the global level. Working in silos is not the answer, as was painfully demonstrated by the global response to the COVID pandemic. More global crises, unfortunately, will come. They will require a multi-institutional, and multi-stakeholders respond, and perhaps an all of government approach. A body capable of bringing together multilateral agencies, international financial institutions, and government ministries to address mega crisis in the future merit serious consideration. And at the core of any reform of the global governance uh, structure, is the central tenet that member states remain the final arbiters. We have heard that little to no progress towards the SCG has been made in the last two years. COVID and Ukraine can be plain, but perhaps there is another reason. 
as the Secretary General pointed out at the beginning of the year, the global financial system is morally bankrupt and not fit for purpose. The question that I want to pose, and it's very simple, who has the authority and commitment to effect the necessary changes and direction? Who are the rule setters in this space? Professor Sack has spoken about the capital markets. What is the role of capital market in narrowing the financing gap? We witness in Glasgow the launch of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero with 130 trillion. We also have the Mobilis, an initiative by the UK government, not to mention climate bonds, SDRs, and other similar initiatives. In all of this, my worry is that if we do not coordinate effectively with all the stakeholders, we're gonna find ourselves in more problem. And here, I just wanna uh, offer a word of caution. And that is that in our haste to solve one crisis, we must be careful what, that we do not create another one. Let me conclude by thanking our organizers for bringing us together and for sharing the expertise and the knowledge that have been uh, put on the table. But again, I go back to what I said, that in some ways we need to see how we can bring all these fantastic ideas and recommendations into fruition. Because at the end of the day, if nothing comes out of this, maybe we'll come next year, following year, and we'll be engaged in the same uh, conversation. So thank you. Uh, very much for the opportunity and I'm, I, my apologies as I already have another appointment that I need to attend to. Uh, all the best and all success in the, uh, you know, the final presentation that is to come. Thank you very much. Ambassador, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I asked Didier to allow me to say a few words. So we thank you very much for joining us for the meeting. And just to mention that we count on your thought leadership on the high level expert panel to complete the MBI development, but also to request the panel to create the open space for further discussions as to how the MBI should be used. And it's then, of course, our responsibility to push international organizations to align with the new vision. And as you said, guided by national governments. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate it. Didier, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, Ambassador, for sharing your insights and takeaway. Uh, we'll carry on with the program. I will now invite uh, Mr. Oliver Pattison. Uh, Mr. Pattison is the Chief of Section for Countries in Special Situations in the Office of the Executive Secretary of uh, UNESCO, uh, being the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, so we'll share with us some of the findings of a recent report that was published uh, precisely focusing on Asia Pacific countries with uh, special needs. So the floor is yours, Mr. Paris. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Didier. Uh, I'm actually connecting from two different devices. Audio is on one stream, video on the other. So I hope that's not too confusing. Um, good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. It's uh, certainly my pleasure to speak here in this panel. Um, I'd like to I'd like to to start by underscoring the importance of um, paying attention to vulnerable countries for SCAP, um, which is the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Um, in fact, of our 62 members and associate members, 37 are either least developed uh, countries, landlocked developing countries, or small island developing states, which we kind of refer to as vulnerable countries or in special situations. Um, now, despite this large number of countries, um, these are heavily underrepresented in the Asia Pacific's region's uh, economic activities. Um, they account only for 3% of the region's GDP and about 3% of trade and goods and services. 
Um, let me highlight that the Asia Pacific countries in special situations were not on track to attain any of the 17 SDGs, uh, even before the onset of the COVID pandemic. And uh, clearly the, the pandemic has further dampened their prospects. Um, we've estimated that an additional 7.8 million people were pushed into extreme poverty by the end of 2021 in these 37 countries. Um, and the median fiscal deficit uh, increased from a pre-pandemic of about 1% of GDP to 4% of GDP in 2021. Um, also, as we saw the, the median debt to, debt to GDP ratio uh, increasing by more than four percentage points. Um, now, while these challenges are not limited to the countries in special situations, um, their limited coping capacity and particularly their narrow domestic resource base um, and the limited options that they have to um, raise resources suggests that the road to recovery will certainly be more protracted. Um, we heard earlier that the magnitude of fiscal stimulus and LDCs has been significantly lower in other than in other developing countries. Um, and, and this points to the risk of a, a K-shaped recovery in which some countries of uh, some groups of countries may, may be recovering much slower than others. Um, and I think this is certainly a cause for concern. Um, there are only eight years left until 2030, and uh, mobilizing resources to recover from COVID in line with the 2030 agenda is certainly an urgent task. Um, but our estimates show that um, LDCs and LLDCs alone would need to mobilize about 19% for LDCs and 8% uh, for LLDCs of their GDP um, every year to attain the SDGs. Um, so that's clearly out of reach. And, and the financing needs for, for small island developing states are, are, will certainly be much higher given their small scattered population basis. Um, now, despite the ongoing discussions about uh, innovative financing, um, I do believe that three traditional sources will continue to dominate the financing landscape in vulnerable countries. Um, and these are tax revenues, FDI and ODA. Um, let, I mean, let me turn to, to tax revenues. Um, these have been particularly limited and volatile in, in uh, several vulnerable countries um, because of their narrow and undiversified revenue bases. Um, but many countries do face a huge untapped potential to increase revenue, especially tax revenue. And we've estimated for some of these countries that these untapped revenues could be up to 12% of GDP. Um, now, in light of the ongoing pandemic and the informal nature of many vulnerable countries, um, one feasible avenue to unlock revenues would of course be to improve tax administrations, um, particularly by increasing collection efficiency from existing taxpayers and also minimizing leakages. Um, let me turn to FDI. Um, FDI is also an important source of financing, um, but we've seen that it's volatile. It's been certainly volatile over the last few years and it's actually been trending lower since 2017. Um, and at the same time, countries that have been able to attract FDI um, tend to have either extractive sectors or uh, and or low cost labor sectors. Um, and as a result of this, I think uh, relying on FDI as a vehicle for a sustain sustainable recovery will, will be difficult for, for vulnerable countries. Um, thirdly, ODA. I mean, ODA remains the single most important source of external finance for many countries in special situations. Um, while multilateral donors are stepping up their lending and grant support in the wake of the pandemic, um, the impact on bilateral ODA and its outlook is still unraveling. Um, and, and I think there's certainly in many countries uh, room for improving the more efficient use and maybe equitable use of ODA um, and how to channel it better towards efforts to achieve the SDGs. So, so more work can be done there. Um, there are a number of emerging opportunities in the rapidly expanding global market for thematic bonds, um, such as green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds. Um, the expansion of the green bond market has been particularly noticeable, noticeable um, and I think the value of uh, green bond issuance in the Asia Pacific region um, increased around tenfold between 2015 and 2020. Um, a number of countries, Fiji, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, have been benefiting from this um, trend. Um, but this is certainly not an option for all, as we've also heard uh, from, from uh, some previous speakers, um, not only owing to regulatory and technical capacity gaps, um, but also concerns over debt sustainability, 
um, of the currently in, in our region, um, 11 of the 37 countries uh, in special situations are considered to be at a high risk of public debt uh, distress, and eight of these are small island developing states. Um, maybe let me conclude um, by emphasizing that we do think that regional cooperation plays an important part in, in uh, mobilizing resources to support the vulnerable countries. Um, and we've, we've been trying to collaborate through a number of issues, um, issues uh, and initiatives with these countries. Um, SCAP has been collaborating with the Pacific Islands um, Forum Secretariat to, to look at some um, strategies for debt relief, such as um, debt for climate swaps, which can be a mechanism to simultaneously reduce debt exposure and increase investments in climate mitigation or adaptation. Um, we recently worked with the uh, United Nations country team um, to assist the government in Bhutan in, in building the necessary infrastructure for a bond market. And this actually resulted in the government um, issuing its first sovereign bond in 2020 to meet its uh, financing needs. Um, we're establishing a regional network on infrastructure financing and PPPs um, with, with the idea to, to provide a platform for policymakers and experts to, to discuss the opportunities and gaps um, and also to uh, advocate um, the establishment and harmonization of legal and regulatory frameworks for PPPs. Um, I think that's certainly something that, that we need to have to be able to tap the private sector more to contribute to, to reaching the SDGs. Um, and then um, you, I just mentioned the private sector. There's a long ex established uh, sustainable business network where I think you know the aim is to promote the mobilization of resources um, by not only facilitating engagement among governments, but as, as I mentioned, the private sector and other stakeholders, because there's certainly a lot of, of uh, I think as we've heard, there is a lot of um, money out there. There is a lot of financial resources available. Um, they're just not there where they should be. Um, so we need to think a little bit more creatively about how can we get to get it there to where it's needed most. Um, I'll end my in in intervention there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for your time. And uh, it was a pleasure joining this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver, for sharing those views. Uh, extremely uh, useful and, and relevant. Uh, for, for SEEDS and LDCs in particular. So thank you for your presence today. I'll move on immediately by inviting Mr. Jean-Baptiste Jacouton. Uh, Jean-Baptiste is Research Officer on Sustainable Finance in, at the Agence Française de Développement, AFD. His work concentrates on the role and challenges of public development banks in SDG financing. So he will share with us insight from his research in this topic. So the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Jacouton. Thank you, moderator, and uh, many thanks to the hosting governments and organizations for the opportunity. So the story I want to share with you today is that of a group of actors which has been long overlooked within the global financial architecture and which is now experiencing a worldwide renaissance. There are 500 financial institutions worldwide accounting for more than 10% of annual global investments. They have public mandates, and most importantly, they have the capacity to leverage private financing in favor of the SDGs. Here, I'm referring to public development banks, which have gathered into a global coalition called Finance in Common. It is not only about multilateral development banks that Professor Jeffrey Sachs and my co-panelists have already mentioned, but also about national development banks. So during my intervention, I will start answering two questions. The first one is, what does it mean to be a public development bank in a small island developing state, both in terms of general characteristics and in terms of SDG alignment? And here I will derive many insights from the database that we have built at the French Development Agency with our partners at Peking University. And the second question relates to public development banks' main challenges to leverage finance in favor of the SDGs. So next slide, please. I don't know. Yes, I had slides, uh, so I don't know if uh, you can put them on screen. Thank you. Um, so yes. when looking at the sorry, Jean Baptiste, just, uh, yes, they are doing it now. Yes, now they are. Uh, yes, sorry for this. Great, thank you very much. So when looking at the ecosystem, we observe that small island developing states have quite a long history with uh, public development banks. 
And in fact, as early as 1936, Mauritius created its own bank. And today we identified 31 public development banks located in the small island developing states. And uh, as you can see, most of them are national institutions. And we observe that two thirds of um, the small island developing states have at least one public development bank. So on average, these institutions have 130 million US dollar in total assets. And even though in absolute terms, uh, this is rather small, these institutions have in fact an important weight in their respective economies. The balance sheet is on average 10% of the national GDP, but in some countries, this even reaches 20% of the GDP. So therefore, these institutions have the capacity to intervene massively in their respective economies. And what is also very interesting is that even though they do not seek to maximize the profits, these institutions do have a positive net income of 2.3 million US dollar on average. Now regarding the mandates, public development banks play a backbone role in financing small island developing states economies. Most of them serve a wide and diverse population drawing from all layers in society. They promote growth, SMEs, industrial development, regional integration, rural development, so on and so forth. But once we recognize this, one may ask, what is public development bank's relationship with the sustainable development goals? And here, I want to stress a major difficulty that we encounter when analyzing public development bank's contribution to the SDGs. Most of them publish annual activity reports. Unfortunately, these banks do not report on their alignment with the 2030 agenda in the same way. And the lack of common methodology prevents the aggregation of data on public development banks' commitments. And therefore, we can hardly assess the progress made in closing the SDG finance gap. Next slide, please. So this is why at the French Development Agency, we have been developing a tool over the past year called the SDG Prospector that uses artificial intelligence to read public development banks annual reports in a systematic way. In this fashion, we're able to draw a comprehensive mapping of public development banks orientation towards the SDGs. And here, I really want to insist, we are looking at the way public development banks showcase their own activities. And what we observe in the small island developing states is that public development banks tend to favor three main SDGs. The first one is on sustainable growth and decent job creation. The second is no hunger, which is very consistent with the fact that small island developing states import around 60% of the food. And eventually, public development banks in the small island developing states um, tend to take into account climate action more than in any other locations. And of course, this clearly resonates with the vulnerabilities related to climate change and the urgent need for climate adaptation solutions highlighted uh, throughout this, these panels. And however, what is a bit more surprising, um, but unfortunately this is the case for all public development banks in the world, is that uh, PDBs uh, tend to pay fewer attention to biodiversity and especially life below water. At least this is, I mean, this SDG does not appear uh, in, the, in their annual reports. Next slide, please. Um, so now I'd like to close my intervention with a few takeaways. As I have underlined, public development banks already play a key role in supporting the economies. However, we still have difficulties in assessing the overall contribution to the SDGs. Therefore, I would invite the governments of small island developing states to urge the public development banks to report systematically on the SDG alignment. In the meantime, it is necessary to reinforce public development banks' capacities in these countries. More than any other development actors, they know what is at stake locally and they act as platforms for mainstreaming SDG financing. For example, at the French Development Agency, we have granted a green credit line of 30 million euros to the Caribbean Development Bank, which aims at developing infrastructure and helping Caribbean states adapt to climate risks. Moving forward, the Finance in Common Coalition aims at creating synergies across public development banks worldwide. And it also aims at strengthening the relationships with other public and private actors, such as the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero and the Network for Greening the Financial System. So finally, to all public development banks in the small island developing states, I want to remind that the Finance in Common Summit 2022 
will take place from the 18th to the 20th of October in Abidjan. And of course, they're all invited to join. And to all of you, I want to say thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Baptiste, for sharing uh, your insight of the role of public and multilateral development banks, especially in seats. Um, extremely useful contribution to the debate today. Um, thank you again for your presence. I'll move on with the last intervention, which is a, a video recorded message from Mr. Jean Pesne. Jean Pesne is the Global Director for Finance, Competitiveness and Innovation at the World Bank, who has spoken a lot about the role of uh, Bretton Woods Institution and Development Bank. So it will be very interesting to hear uh, his views and what have been uh, the contribution uh, of the World Bank to make uh, financial system more resilient and expand financial opportunities and public finance in support of sustainability or climate action and green and blue economy. So my colleague from SDSN, if you could launch the video, that would be excellent. Good morning. Just making sure you can hear the sound. It's frozen. Good evening, good afternoon. Can you hear the sound when he speaks? We can just hear uh, a couple of words and then stop us. Okay, so super, super. I just wanted to make sure. I, I will launch it now. Thanks. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to join you for this panel. I'm really sorry I was not able to join virtually and in person, uh, but I'm very happy to have the opportunity uh, to address you by video. First, I would like to applaud you for this timely discussion on financing development priorities and its framing around the acute challenges faced by small island states. The time for action is now. We are living in a time of overlapping crises which are making the 2030 development goals an even steeper challenge. For the climate crisis alone, the OECD has estimated that we need to invest 4.2 trillion to achieve the low carbon transition and tackle the climate crisis in emerging market and developing economies, 4.2 trillion. This estimate was even before the 2022 food and energy security crisis. Development finance alone is not enough. For the last three fiscal years, the World Bank has lent around 100 million annually. This is a tiny fraction of what is needed. So we must attract private capital to fund development priorities at all levels, by developing markets, through investment fund and financing projects. Yet today, only 5% of global investment assets are located in emerging markets. So how can we do that? In my part of the World Bank book, Finance, Competitiveness and Innovation, we are working with governments to develop markets through adoption of international standards for sustainable financial system with partners such as the International Sustainability Standard. We are helping clients such as Colombia and Bangladesh achieve greater consistency and comparability of sustainable taxonomies, ESG rating, and climate and sustainability reporting. This is crucial for ensuring that countries, companies, and projects which need financing most are not excluding from sustainable finance. We are helping countries like Indonesia and Jamaica manage risk with disaster risk finance and stress testing work with banking sector regulators. Through our toolkit for policymakers to greening the financial system, we are working in over 50 countries to develop domestic capital markets which align with international standards and thereby can attract a diverse set of investors. At the investment fund level, we need collective instrument vehicles to attract a wide range of partners. Here, we have lessons to learn from mobilizing private capital for development more broadly. For instance, in Colombia, in a partnership between the AFC and local development banks, we were able to mobilize 1.8 billion for domestic pension fund into a road infrastructure program. Two investment platforms were announced by our IFC colleagues last year to mobilize climate finance in this way. A $2 billion fund with Amundi will help to mobilize up to $13 billion of private investment into sustainable and green bonds in emerging markets. Another example is a World Bank Group and Donor Partnership with your expansion fund 
which has resulted in 1 billion invested in regional and South Africa infrastructure equity funds. We are working to expand this kind of coordination platform to include European institutional investors as well. One key element to this support is linking global investors with their local counterpart to support mutual learning and sharing of risk. World Bank team will play, has played an integral role in helping establish a consortium of Kenyan pension funds to work together to invest in local infrastructure and development projects. Finally, at the project level, we use the Sustainable Development Bank for our own issuance to signal that climate and sustainability concerns are integrated across our work, regardless of sectors, region, or countries. Since launching the world's first green bond in 2008, the World Bank has issued approximately 16 billion worth of 185 green bonds in 23 currencies. In 2018, the World Bank helped fund the global bond, blue bond market to support ocean-based sustainability projects. We also work with clients to bring more emerging market sovereign into this growing market. Egypt is one example. At the same time, we see other promise, promising instruments getting ground, including sustainability-linked loans and bonds, which pay out according to the achievement of key performance indicators. Chile was the first sovereign to issue one of these bonds earlier this year. The recent issuance by World Bank Treasury of the Wildlife Conservation Bond supporting the rhino population in South Africa has received much attention as a model which could be adapted to SDGs. To summarize, under the World Bank Climate Change Action Plan, we are moving beyond green projects to greening entire economies. This type of connection, collective action and partnership approach is the only way to meet developing country needs and the broader SDG role. Thank you very much, including for the opportunity to join you today uh, through this uh, intervention, and I wish you the best for your proceeding. Thank you. So with the um, intervention from Mr. Jean Pesme, who I thank for, for his time and his contribution, we end this uh, second panel. We've heard a lot about uh, challenges, but also the various recommendations and uh, solutions that have been made by all panelists to increase financing to, uh, for, for SDGs and a mini call for action as well, a mini call for changes. So we we'll certainly uh, take this as takeaways for the global debate uh, in the UN and with our SDSM colleagues. Uh, all questions and answers that have been put in the boxes will be passed on to the various panelists as well, and we'll make our best efforts to make sure that you receive an answer. So with that, I hand over the floor to Simona and Isabella. Over to you, please. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, run out of time. So we have already heard also the um, closing remarks uh, by uh, Ambassador, Samoa Ambassador Fatuma Nava. Uh, so um, to close uh, this uh, event, I just uh, would like on the behalf of SDSN and uh, also uh, of uh, the UN resident coordinators, uh, a big uh, thank uh, to all the panelists uh, for uh, the very uh, thoughtful and uh, challenging uh, presentations. We have uh, heard uh, in um, the uh, latest uh, uh, video uh, from uh, Mr. Pesme uh, from the World Bank uh, that uh, the time for action uh, is now. Uh, I think that uh, all uh, presentations uh, have uh, provided uh, uh, great uh, inputs uh, uh, to move forward uh, on uh, the development agenda. Uh, so um, let's continue uh, the discussion on all these important topics, uh, on the importance uh, of uh, uh, achieving uh, a good measurement of the SDG financing gap, not only in seats, but in all of our countries. Let's think further about the targeted financing mechanisms that can be developed to fill in the gap, and also on the importance of developing a good multidimensional vulnerability index that can be used uh, for uh, uh, changing the uh, allocation criteria of uh, uh, concessional finance. So thank you again uh, to all uh, the panelists, uh, and uh, I hope uh, to see all of you very soon, soon uh, in other uh, challenging uh, discussions. 
Thank you again, uh, everyone, and thank you also uh, to my colleague uh, Didier um, for moderating uh, Panel 2. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.